teams uh, that they are really supporting economic development in, in their communities and their states and so on. And yet, uh, when you look at the amount of research dollars that go into universities, they don't always sort of magnify in terms of business development. And that, frankly, was the case at Hopkins uh, several years ago. And uh, President Daniels uh, decided to bring in Christy um, to, to change that, and she is uh, the senior advisor to the president, uh, to try to take um, the amazing amount of research and discovery that's happening here at Hopkins and uh, turn it into actual companies and licensing revenue and uh, strategic opportunities with companies. So that, I said I wouldn't uh, give a long intro, but I did. So Christy, I'll turn it to you. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. And what a joy to be here at this beautiful venue at Cary Business School. And my condolences to my friends at the University of Maryland. Uh, we stole Alex from you. So I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm happy and proud for, uh, for Johns Hopkins to get a chance to, to, to work with you, Alex. So thank you. Um, yeah, just, just very briefly, I was, um, for 20 years, I was an investor and entrepreneur and company builder, primarily in the medical technology and life sciences space. But I've really turned my attention in the last almost seven years now to doing exactly what Alex just described. Take the incredible research that's happening in and around our various campuses at Johns Hopkins, whether it's faculty or students, and take those ideas to market. And in any way possible that we can do that, bringing in venture capital dollars, and I'll just say one stat because I'm very proud of my team. Um, we've gone from about $40 million of venture capital coming into Johns Hopkins companies to the decade prior to the creation of Johns Hopkins Tech Ventures that I have the, the great honor of running. Um, to the past five years, our numbers average just north of 500 million. So from 40 million to 500 million, really with a dedicated focus on getting our faculty and students ready to talk to the venture and investment community, and then courting those, those very investors. Wonderful, thank you, Christy. And by the way, we will have a fair bit of time for Q&A later, so as you, um, Listen, uh, please think through uh, some questions. So next up is uh, Jeff Cherry, who's the managing partner of Conscious Venture Lab and the CEO of Shift Ventures. So uh, Jeff, tell us a little bit about what you do. Thanks, Alex. Well, first of all, welcome. And uh, um, we're happy to have you here in Baltimore. Um, and uh, thanks for inviting me. And thanks to TN, as always, for including me in this uh, amazing event. So um, I didn't start out as an investor. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I started my first company, an architectural firm, in 1986. Um, so I'm a little older than uh, some of the other people in the venture space. Um, and uh, I built that company for 20 years, turned into a management consulting company, um, sold that company because of a lot of things we saw happening in the world. I started a hedge fund after that, moved back to New York. I'm originally a New Yorker, uh, ran a hedge fund for a few years. And the hedge fund and our consulting business was all based on this idea of conscious capitalism or stakeholder management. So a lot of you may have heard in August of last year, the Business Roundtable came out with a statement saying that uh, they were going to focus on serving all of their stakeholders in business. And I've been working on that idea since about 2004. So we're happy that they finally caught up with us. Um, but uh, the hedge fund was based on that idea. And then uh, I became enamored with this notion that we could change the, um, the narrative around capitalism to help it serve more people. So I decided to leave the hedge fund and start a venture a company and was uh, uh, prompted uh, by a friend of mine, Julie Lenzer, who's in the audience somewhere, and Ken Ullman, to start um, the Conscious Venture Lab here in Maryland. We started in Howard County and then 2015 moved into Baltimore. And uh, our investment thesis is really built on sort of two foundational ideas. One, that there's a new narrative being developed about the purpose of capitalism in society, that it's not simply to serve the needs of shareholders, but you can build a business to serve the needs of all your stakeholders. And in fact, if you do that well, shareholders will be, will be um, rightly re rewarded. And the second is an idea that um, I've had in me for a long time, but <clears throat> um, became more articulate as I spent some time with Steve Case and the Rise of the Rest, that there are smart, talented, and dedicated people equally distributed across our society, but sometimes opportunity is limited and often because limited because of race or gender. So we focus a lot um, on doing a greater uh, amount of outreach into minority and female founders. So trying to find ideas where other people aren't looking. So that's what we do at the Conscious Venture Lab. It's an accelerator and a venture fund uh, based in West Baltimore.
nice job. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth yes. uh, Cho Furtick, who's the uh, co-founder and managing director of Meta um, Angels, and uh, which focuses on, on healthcare. If you could say a few words about um, what you do. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, mic's on? It's um, it, Meta? Meta. It's okay. Uh, so good, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm always happy to come back to Hopkins. I'm an alum from long ago, so I uh, still feel comfortable here. Um, thank you, Tian, for always including me as well. Um, so, um, by training, I'm a cancer biologist, and um, been invest, spent many a year in the lab, in the trenches. So I understand um, the technical aspect, and moved on slowly to the finance side. And um, Meta was started by a few physician investors and myself. These are longtime friends. We also st uh, enjoy investing while still operating. Um, and so we decided to begin Meta, uh, not from your traditional finance, uh, although that's still very, very important, but as um, market end users who can tell if all these innovations might have a place because we are the ultimate end users. And so understanding and ensuring there's product market fit was very important in how we screen deals. We often saw so many healthcare deals coming at us uh, when we were out and about on our own as angels, and we couldn't quite get what they all were. So we are evaluating things more as the ultimate end users, and that is the maybe slight differentiator. Although our membership um, is about half physicians and scientists, the other half are finance. We need everybody on board as well as legal. So it's strategic, but it's also um, open, I will say. Um, and we, I'm based in uh, DC. My other two partners, one is in Philly, the other one's in San Fran. We see deal flow from everywhere. Um, and that is Meta Angels. And uh, this is a great uh, neighborhood too for healthcare, certainly Hopkins. Christy, thank you. Um, so uh, we absolutely look at our hometown too. Thanks, so Elizabeth. I'll say. Appreciate it. Um, next up is uh, Chris uh, College, who is the managing partner of TCP Venture Capital, uh, focused on tech ventures. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about what you do. We'd be glad to. Thank you, Tien, and thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, TCP Venture Capital manages three venture capital funds, including the Propel Baltimore Fund which focuses on investing in companies that will headquarter in Baltimore City. So we are investing in any type of technology as long as it does not require FDA approval. We have uh, exactly what Elizabeth <laughs> does. <laughs> this is why we Elizabeth don't compete. Is here. We don't compete. <laughs> um, we have uh, 16 portfolio companies in the city right now, which have raised over $250 million that came from other venture capital funds, not just us, uh, into Baltimore. Uh, those companies employ about 750 people here in Baltimore City, so we do think we've uh, created a lot of value and brought a lot of uh, technology uh, professionals into the ecosystem here in Baltimore. And that's us. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Chris. And last but certainly not least, uh, Mike Avon, who's a partner at ABS uh, Capital Partners, um, which I did not know until a few days ago. It uh, stands for Alex Brown and Sons. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so, uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. Uh, well, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Tien, and thank you to uh, the Cary School. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here today. Uh, so I'm a partner at ABS Capital. We are the ABS's Alex Brown and Sons. Um, so ABS Capital is based here in Baltimore. Uh, we've been around for 30 years. We're uh, celebrating our 30th anniversary as a fund uh, this year and came out of the original Alex Brown. Uh, we were founded by the um, former CEO of Alex Brown back in, in 1990. So we have deep Baltimore roots. Uh, ABS Capital is a growth equity fund. So we invest uh, after the early venture stage, where, where some of my co-panelists invest, but before the private equity stage. So typically, we're dealing with companies that are, you know, got a minimum five, ten million dollars of revenue. They've proven a product market fit um, in the industry. They have a business going, but they need help getting to the next step. And so we come in with both capital and expertise in building companies from that five, ten, twenty million of revenue to fifty million plus, uh, and either help them sell, uh, help them go public, or potentially sell. Uh, to another larger financial sponsor later. Uh, we have two broad groups, a healthcare group, which is very active in the area. We have two active uh, portfolio companies in the Baltimore area, 
out of the healthcare group, and then the software and technology and services group, which is the group I lead, uh, which is really everything else. It's the IT group and, uh, and tech and tech services. Uh, we invest in areas such as cybersecurity, uh, education technology, fintech, logistics, marketing and e-commerce enablement. So we're fairly broad in the areas we invest in, but very focused uh, on the, the growth stage. Um, my career, I've, I've been uh, both an operator and investor, like some of the other people up here. So I actually helped start a company here in Baltimore called Millennial Media, which was a big mobile advertising company uh, that we took public and eventually sold to Verizon. I uh, live down in, in the D.C. area, but uh, spend a lot of my time up here and really uh, proud to be a, a deep part of the ecosystem here in Baltimore. So thanks for having me today. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. So um, as you can tell, there's um, each of our panelists have different roles in terms of supporting, growing uh, startups. And so um, we just listened to great pitches, and uh, I thought I'd throw out to the panel just to try to get their sense of um, what an ideal investment looks like. Maybe you could tell sort of one of your big success stories in uh, supporting or growing a, um, a startup just to give the entrepreneurs in the crowd in, um, sort of a sense of uh, how to pitch themselves and, and uh, get ready for investment. So I guess we'll start with you, if you don't start, mind, Christy. OK, I was going to say start at the other end, with the, <laughs> the real investor, but, but sure. Um, look, I, we're, most of the companies and entrepreneurs that we work with are fairly early stage. And I think the thing that differentiates those that go from idea to raising money is coachability. Um, and the ability to really listen and understand. We run um, a fabulous program with our colleagues at the University of Maryland and others called i -Corps. And the whole point is to really test, um, in a way, that hypothesis. So I have an idea for a pen that never runs out of ink. But I need to go talk to people who use pens and find out if they're really willing to buy that and, and listen and understand, well, people actually don't want a new pen um, that has ink. They, they want something else. They want a stylus or whatever. And so um, I think that to, for, for us, when we're really looking for folks that we want to coach and go all in and introduce them to investors, it is really that ability to take a step back, acknowledge that you've made progress and you might have a good idea, but what does the market need and are you able to really take advice from those that, that want to help? Very linear guy, so let's just keep going. Yeah, I, I, it's it's hard to add much to that because we're a much of the same mindset, right? So, um, a lot of uh, or a few of the companies, and we're getting more connected, I think, with with Christy now that are coming out of Hopkins or coming into our program, um, and we're so we're usually the first professional money in, if if you will, um, and so, and we went we invest a hundred thousand dollars of the first check. So you think of and for somewhere between four and eight percent equity, it's on a convertible note. So you think about that; it's coming from zero to about five hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Um, so there's a few things that we know that they're probably going to change their idea at some time. They're with us. So one is coachability is one of the most important thing. The team is way more important than the idea because at that stage the idea is still developing. They're likely to make a pivot. They're likely to change that idea. Um, and we're likely to come up with an idea to help them change. And if they're not willing to, um, to take in all the information, the thing that we do is an on-site accelerator. There's a bunch of our um, grads here in the audience. And one of the reasons that we do on-site as opposed to um, a distributor like Village Capital, we love those guys, and they do a different um, program than we do. Is that because about our program is about 16 weeks, and about halfway through the program, the entrepreneurs in the program start learning more from each other than they do from us or any of the consultants we bring in. And that's really important. And if you're not open to taking those ideas, you're not likely to, one, be successful in our program, or two, be successful in general, because there's all sorts of new knowledge out there. So we're really focused on the team. Um, we're, you know, we've, we've passed on some really, really, really interesting ideas because we knew we wouldn't be able to work with the team, that they didn't have the mindset uh, and, you know, sort of a learner's mindset. So um, I, I, I hope that's answering the question. I think that one of the most important things to us is having a learner's mindset um, and being open to all of the knowledge that's resonant, not only in this room, but in the city and through our networks. Awesome. Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, going linear is great because yeah. I'm the next money in. Right. Um, we are we invest up. in mid seed and Series A, and for Meta, um, we invest in uh, both um, classic med devices, you know, some therapeutics, 
um, preferably the 505B2. Okay, things that have already been approved. And health SAS. Um, so for and both health per se and wellness. And for us, um, for the SAS um, products, it's very much about the team. Definitely. And so to reiterate what Christy and Jeff have been saying, the team is everything. You can take a B product, but if you have an A team, you can make it work. Usually not the other way around, right? Bet on the jockey, not the horse. And some of our um, great, um, I love them, <laughs> um, startups are ones where the team just can just roll. And mid-seed, you never quite know. You're still taking a big risk. Of course, the valuation is attractive, and that's partly the deal. And you also want to help them. But you can see the great potential when the team is solid. If you're a first-time entrepreneur, and I hate when they say, you should be experienced. Well, you have to start somewhere. So, you know, I understand the catch-22. If, if you can surround yourself with experienced people and not just marquee names that you you know, just stick up there, but actually can help you and will help you. We'll call them to make sure. We'll believe in you then, okay? When it comes to devices, therapeutics, and others where um, uh, there, the tech has to work. If it doesn't work, it's game over. You can't take a rocket to Pluto if it's only meant to go to Mars, right? However, the team still should be very coachable because if, uh, especially if it's the first time, it's a torturous road and you still always need your plan C, D, E. And if they're coachable, we'll work with you. That's what I'd say. All right, great, Chris. And I did actually line you up in a <laughs> logical <laughs> manner here. Okay. So there you, there you <laughs> take us to the next step. Sure. I think the, uh, the question was, what, uh, give us a case study of one of your big wins. Um, I, I think one of our biggest wins um, is probably a big win for two reasons. Uh, which was uh, Red Alley Analytics, which we invested in. We were the, uh, the first investors, the first institutional money there. And we made a lot of money, which was good. We sold it to Raytheon four years later, uh, successful for all the investors. But I think why it was a really big win for us, and, and Mike's probably got a very similar story to tell as well, is after we made the investment, Guy Filippelli, the CEO, turned around and started his own venture capital fund called Squadra. And I think uh, Mike Leffer is here from Squadra today. I think what we need to see, and, and why I think that's really a big win, is a lot of times people make money and they go to Florida. What, <laughs> what Baltimore needs is more people making money, reinvesting it either in a fund or in other companies or spinning off companies. And I'll let Mike tell you about his experiences, but Millennial Media is a perfect example. So we had a small Millennial Media experience in, in Red Alley Analytics, and hopefully that's going to spur you know, 10, 12 other new companies that uh, we can invest in, and so can they. Probably going last is everybody's already given all the good answers, yeah. but uh, uh, but no, I, you know, just to that that point on millennial, I'm really proud to have been a part of millennial and founded another company after that with some ex millennial people. Um, but we now have, I think, four or five different companies in the area, and a number of us are investors as well. They're all ex millennial people, and and I think it's in also um, uh, you know, a number of funds that came out of it as well. Um, so I think it's been really good for the region. I think it's important that companies, when they get the success, which is a lot of hard work and always some luck too. That you know, part of the uh, part of the job when you get that luck is to give back to the community. We just invested in White Box, uh, which is a great like, company. I love that company. Millennial Media <laughs> spinoff with Marcus Starzl. Yeah, so. Marcus is great. He's one of my favorites. So smart investment. Um, so you know, what are we looking for at, the, at a little bit later stage? It's really a similar theme. So people first. If we don't back a great team, it never works ever. Um, we might be looking for something a little bit different in a team than an early stage team. We're usually backing the founder as the CEO, vast majority of the time. Um, but we're typically looking for somebody who has, you know, navigated those early stages, um, has built a defensible business model. Uh, honestly, even at this stage, the idea probably doesn't matter that much. The idea itself, it's really, is there a defensible business model that you can now scale? We are always looking for industries where we think there's a wave behind the industry. So, you know, we're picking areas and being a little bit later stage investor, we can do this where we think there's already a major market. That market's developing. It's a good time to jump in that, uh, in that space. Um, but we're really looking for teams that have shown signs that they can, uh, you know, weave through all of the changes that might be happening in a fast developing space, build a defensible business model, and be coached. And we're typically, where we're bringing our value is in that coaching. We find teams that have what we call deep domain expertise in their space. 
um, typically uh, have businesses that have developed a data set around that business that can be leveraged uh, as they try to scale their business. And that's some of the expertise we bring is to work with them closely to leverage the data they have to turn what might not look like data businesses into data businesses, which is how we, we think we drive the most value. And we want to back people that are open to that kind of advice. So we might be coming in and saying, we know very little about your specific market that you're in. We're backing you because you're the expert and you've shown expertise and ability to build a business in this space. But we know a lot about how to take a business from 10 or $20 million of revenue to 50 to 100. You know, trust us and follow us. We'll work with you. We'll work shoulder to shoulder with you. But be open-minded about the types of people you need to add to your management team, changes you might need to make to your management uh, style uh, as you scale your team. Uh, and help that you can bring in from the outside, not just us, but outside uh, board members, advisors, and others. Um, but ultimately, I think all along the stage of investing, it comes down to backing the right people, the right people who will, who, who uh, are, you know, have that right kind of entrepreneurial spirit, and they have to be very smart, but they also have to be smart enough to know that nobody knows everything. You need help, and people that are accepting of help, they'll kind of stick to their their knitting, but will accept help and coaching along the way. Uh, and you know, we find that that is the uh, more often than not, the difference between success and failure. Great. Well, thanks, Mike. And now I'm going to start on that end. So you got to pay attention. You gave me a hard question, question now. I'm yeah, sure. exactly. <laughs> uh, we'll re reverse the order. So, so Chris and Mike, you as well talked a little bit about um, Baltimore. So I want to actually do a deeper dive into um, the Baltimore uh, ecosystem here. Um, talk about maybe the, the strengths that we can leverage here in Baltimore, maybe some of the shortcomings we can address. And um, I thought maybe the best way to pitch this question is we're, we're in a mayoral race right now. So what advice would you give uh, to the next mayor in terms of um, fostering entrepreneurial growth? Here wow, you're going to start with a guy who lives in Northern Virginia, too. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Um, so I'm going to tell you, I, I, this is not, not always popular in Baltimore, so I'm sorry, but I, I, I feel strongly about it. I always take a regional approach. I think that you know all of us here, whether D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Baltimore, et cetera, you know, need to stop. Uh, there's some good, healthy competition, but I think overall we have to look at ourselves as an amazing region here. And when you look at the greater Baltimore, Washington area, you're talking about a region with almost 10 million people. We might have crossed that now. Um, fourth largest metro area on a combined basis in the country. Amazing education, certainly Hopkins uh, being one of those, but amazing, amazingly educated population around here. Um, the benefits of the federal government uh, certainly defense, NSA up this way, healthcare, et cetera. Um, some cap venture capital here, you have people sitting here, we probably don't have enough infrastructure here yet, but certainly uh, drawing interest from outside capital. So there is access to capital here. We can make this better and all, all of us up here are trying to do that. Uh, and an amazing market. So a you know, relatively affluent market through the region. Um, a diverse market through the region, so a great market to sell to, both on the business side and the consumer side. So, you know, if we think about this as a great region, then I think, you know, I would, my, my advice to the, the new mayor of Baltimore would be, you know, thinking about where is your place, where is, where's your leverage in this great region? Um, having invested in Baltimore, spent some time living in Baltimore, and both built companies um, and, and, and been involved in a venture fund here, you know, you have uh, an amazing uh, infrastructure for healthcare around here. Certainly, a lot of that coming out of Hopkins. Uh, we've invested in several healthcare IT-related companies here that have been big fit, big hits for us. I think reinvesting in uh, as a city um, in both in in, uh, in in Hopkins, but in the infrastructure to build up uh, healthcare-related companies around here is great. It's certainly a great need in the country, and I think there's a competitive advantage here in Baltimore. I think there's actually some really interesting logistics businesses around here, uh, leveraging e-commerce in particular. Marcus Startzel's company is, is one of those. Um, Marcus worked for me at Millennial and is one of my favorites. I've backed another one of his companies. Uh, but uh, you have Amazon now located in, in Northern Virginia, uh, but with a meaningful um, uh, kind of logistics uh, infrastructure around Baltimore. And I think leveraging that and building up that is a great idea in the region. So I think taking the strengths, doubling down on those, um, and then this is the part that might not be that popular, you know, not trying to compete on everything else. Baltimore isn't D.C. Baltimore isn't San Francisco. Baltimore isn't New York. And that's great. Baltimore is its own town, its own city. It has its own strengths and weaknesses. And I think, you know, thinking about where the real strengths are here and doubling down on those versus trying to be something it's not uh, is, the best, um, is the best advice. I want to add one more. I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot on this. It's something I'm passionate about. 
definitely, you know, we need to continue to invest in physical infrastructure and, you know, particularly transportation. Driving up here from Northern Virginia is a disaster. Um, <laughs> I took the train this morning because I'm going to New York afterwards. It's a little better, but we could, we could continue to invest there as well. But I think uh, all leaders around here should be thinking about how do we get those 10, min 10 million people to move around this very large region and uh, create the most, uh, uh, the most efficient routes to creating the most, uh, most value in the, in the region. That was a lot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I agree with everything Mike just said. Um, I, I do think there's a couple really standout strengths. Um, a couple of those are the software engineers we have coming out of the federal government or the three-letter agencies. Because uh, if you're trying to find a software engineer in an early-stage company, and here in Baltimore we complain about how hard it is, try finding them in New York, try finding them in Silicon Valley, try finding them in Boston. It's much easier here. We have much higher supply. We also have a lot of great infrastructure in cyber here, uh, and then also healthcare. So health, those three areas, I think, we stand out and can make a, a real claim that we're unique in the entire United States for all three of those. Um, that said, I think there are uh, a couple struggles or a couple things, and I'll be very blunt. Um, the things that we do in Baltimore is we are we have an inferiority complex to start with. We always talk about the negatives, so I even hesitate to say it. But if I were looking at the new mayor, and I'd say the first thing you need to f focus on is crime. I mean, I spend a lot of my time trying to recruit companies for our one fund, the Propel Baltimore Fund, to Baltimore. In the last year or two, it's become harder because of the crime situation in Baltimore. Um, the, the other thing that I think we really need to focus on is collaboration and coordination. In the last two or three years, I think a lot of our efforts have sprung up throughout the region and throughout the state in a lot of different locations. But you have more incubators, more accelerators, more co-working space um, than we ever have had in Maryland. And a lot of it's in different locations, and I think it's diffusing where it's not coordinated or collaborated as much as it could be. I think that would help the, uh, the region out as well. And I'll leave some more for Elizabeth since okay, I don't want to take it all. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, <laughs> uh, what we could potentially pitch to the mayor uh, to bring entrepreneurship here or capital? What, what was it exactly? Exactly, yeah. So how do we leverage the strengths and address oh. weaknesses in the area? Yeah. Um, so I'm a little biased because I'm from D.C., although I've lived here too. Um, I, I think you, much better marketing is needed uh, by the corporations that are here. Uh, even Hopkins uh, do more, uh, need to get out more. You know, you see the great universities out west, like your Stanford, they leverage their partnerships with great companies uh, doing more of that and marketing uh, your, what is it, Under Armour and other great success stories here. I don't hear that just down, you know, 95. I don't hear it. And you should, I, I think that would be one way because unfortunately, yeah, the press will you know, hunker down on the negative. Um, and I think uh, it's, it, it'll take time. It's not going to happen just like that. But in order to attract talent, have people want to live here, you need to jazz them up. Of course, tax credits and all that. But you need to get them really excited about the city to want to move here and live here, I think. So with regards to marketing, I hope you're all using social media right now. <laughs> there are banners here and Baltimore in the background. Mm -hmm. So... Thank you, Jeff. So um, this is a real pet peeve of mine. So if you if you went through the Conscious Venture Lab, you want to leave now because you've heard this a thousand times. You guys can get up and go. Um, I'm I moved here from New York City, so, and I lived in D.C. for 30 years. So I've got a, a pretty good view of all of this. So let me ask a question: How many people in the room think that if um, if next year there are 100,000 new jobs in Baltimore, that would be a good thing for the city? You think that raise your hand? Okay. How many people know where new jobs come from? Startups. Startups. New jobs come from startups. Steve Case always says, you don't have to care about startups. I know I'm the second time I'm bringing his name up, but he says a lot of good things. You don't have to care about startups. You only have to care about startups if you care about the economic uh, prospects of your city. You don't have to, but if you care about that, you probably should. So last week there was an article in Baltimore Business Journal about um, developers that had a meeting at the Center Club, 
and they were talking about just this question. You know, what are we going to do about the, the city? We're not able to lease as much office space. We're having problems bringing people here. They're talking about crime, and yes, we have a problem with crime in the city, and everyone knows that, and that's a big issue, and we have to deal with it. And I went through this whole article that said, stop complaining, do something about it. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That's great. And the thing that they want to do is hold the politicians' feet to the fire. And I'm here to tell you, if you think City Hall is going to solve this problem, you're delusional. I wanted to, I wanted, I wanted to reach out to them and say, how many of you major real estate developers have invested in venture capital funds in Baltimore? Because where do you think those companies are coming from? You think if you hold the mayor's feet to the fire, there's going to be all of a sudden new companies being sprouted up here in Baltimore? That's not the answer. It's part of the problem. We have to solve that problem. But if we're not supporting entrepreneurship in Baltimore with our dollars, right? A lot, all of us are doing all of that stuff, but everyone's got to do it. Those people out there who are complaining about what's happening in the city, the, 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 um, the vision of the city, I think that's absolutely right. We have to do a better job at that. And all of that stuff will start to, to, start to move in the right direction if we start to support entrepreneurship, not just us on the stage, but everyone, everyone. Those, those I'm sure, in that room of developers who are complaining about holding the mayor's feet to the fire that there was probably a, a plenty of capital that the entrepreneurs in this room could use to create more jobs. So that's... Love your passion. <laughs> Sometimes. Some well, people say that. Some people like, shut the hell up. <laughs> so, Christy, I think you've been uh, thinking a little bit about this. Yeah, I mean, I, I do say that I wake up every single day thinking about how to change the skyline of Baltimore. And I really won't be satisfied that I've done a good job until the skyline is filled with the names of tech and biotech companies coming out of Hopkins and beyond. And I think it's a real possibility. And let me just build on a couple of things because I really could, I mean, I could go on and on and on. So I'm going to try to keep it brief um, because I do, I mean, I, I, um, I have spoken to some of the candidates for mayor on this. I think there's I probably will get in trouble for getting too political, but I think there's one in particular that really gets it and is um, um, is finding her way towards a really good message here because I do think you have to partner. I agree with Jeff that it has to be private sector driven, but I do think the messaging from the mayor and the partnership with City Hall um, can be a positive, not a negative. But but let me just build on um, on one or two things. When you think about the assets that we had, and again, I'm just going to draw out a couple of comments that were made. We have incredible assets here. From where we are sitting right now, we are eight miles from CMS that does all of the, sets all the reimbursement standards for medical products in the country. We are about 30 miles from the FDA. We are just a little over 30 miles from the main branches of the NIH. And as Chris said, the three-letter agencies are within striking distance. Boston doesn't have that. San Francisco doesn't have that. They're not near the epicenter of what's happening in healthcare and technology in the country, and we are. And so shame on us if we don't take advantage of that. And if I look at a company, one of our stars, uh, one of our that's come out, you asked earlier about wins, um, is a company called Protenis that was just started by a couple of medical students at Johns Hopkins. They are they developed really innovative software to help hospitals manage cyber security. And they have had not had any trouble hiring data scientists or software engineers because they do hire from folks coming out of the NSA and beyond. They also have the support of, um, of Johns Hopkins, and they have some just really thoughtful founders that have engaged the community. None of their institutional investment, however, was local. And so I think the, the main drawback um, from where the, the folks on the stage sit is that for this early stage funding, it's very difficult to find that institutional funding here um, in Baltimore. There are folks like Chris um, doing yeoman's work, um, trying to gather that those assets. My friends at TEDCO do a really beautiful job um, coming together and, and bringing that, that capital to work, but we don't have any large VC firms. So I, I think we can, we can continue to build on what we're doing. I think capital will follow, but we've got to take advantages of our take advantage of our strengths um, and what we do have and and really get the positive message out there because the momentum is real it is happening we are building companies here we have created over a thousand jobs from companies coming out of hopkins just in the past handful of years so 
this is it's happening right before our eyes and um, and I would love to partner with um, with the next mayor on this more passion, which is fabulous. Um, so I believe we only have a few minutes for questions, but I did, uh, as promised, wanted to open it up uh, to any questions from the crowd. Yes. Uh, just one second um, to make sure that everybody can hear. Thank you. Uh, you, you all were talking about the importance of teams, mostly founders, executive teams, and so on. Can you also tell us about the role of board of directors or maybe advisory boards or with early stage companies and later board of directors? And also, what do you do to promote true diversity on those boards? Anybody? So um, I think, like Elaine was saying, that if you just have people you're putting up there because you want to trade on their names, that all of us see through that pretty quickly. So I think it really matters that the that if you have if you're if you're trying to leverage a board of directors that they, at the early stage anyway that they're going to have to um, have some um, some skin in the game and that doesn't mean money it means they have to be really out there helping you do what you what you do so I think we don't focus a lot on boards unless someone can tell us specifically why someone is on their board. We have a, an entrepreneur in the audience, Jenny, who's got a great advisory team, but the advisory team is specific to what she does and they help her move that forward. So um, that's, I think, the most important thing from the board standpoint. I can yeah, speak to board diversity. Sorry, let's go, go ahead. Go ahead. Just board diversity, just I have really um, two sentences to say on that. There are lots of women in this audience. If you are a male-only company with male-only board of directors, turn to the woman next to you and find out who they are because I yeah. bet they'd be a great board member. I want to say one quick thing about that before you go because, um, as I said, I ran a hedge fund before this. Um, and this is – I'm going to give you another piece of information on that. I ran a hedge fund before this. Two knuckleheads that didn't know anything about Wall Street. We raised seven hundred million dollars um, investing in what we thought were conscious companies. And about three years into that, we started a new portfolio. It was called the diversity portfolio because we had done the research, and what we found that there was really only one thing in terms of diversity that made a difference in terms of um, uh, eliminating fin financial fraud and outperforming the market, that was how many women you had in senior positions and on the board. That's the only thing that mattered. So that fund, which is still in operation, that was run by my, my old partner, he says, it's so crazy, Jeff. I'm like, what? He goes, we can't sell it. I'm like, why can't you sell it? He says, because people don't believe the numbers. They think we're cooking the books. That's how good it is. So take a look next to you if there's a woman. Put her on your board. Mm -hmm. Well, you heard the news story of Solomon Brothers. They will not IPO if you don't have a female on the board. So that is pretty powerful. We'll see what the others do. Goldman, uh, Goldman, Goldman, oh, Goldman. oh, sorry. Goldman. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, 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 right. Everyone, right. Everyone knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You get my point. <laughs> Thanks for that question. I, I, would, I would echo all those statements. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, oh, you were done. Forgot. Oh, advise. I'll just say one thing about advisory board. Early stage startups, you probably can't afford to hire the best of the best, you know, salaries. Having a very good advisory board who actually helps you is key. Absolutely. So you should lean on them. You might give a little equity um, in exchange for the free, free help, but they deserve that. So get an awesome advisory board. Consider them an extension of your team. So I, th I think we have time only for one other question, just to uh, take a different angle. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Jenny Thompson. I am a recent graduate of Conscious Venture Lab. I just want to push back really quickly on the women on boards thing. Look for companies that had it before it was required. Because <laughs> like all the California companies that have to have a woman on the board now, look at the people who were doing it before because they knew it was a smart business decision. Anyway. Good point. Um, Good point. And so, Jeff, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a, of a softball here. But um, Elizabeth, when you were talking about marketing Baltimore and, mm -hmm. and doing the marketing, marketing is my DNA. I always joke, like, I'm never going to do my 23andMe because it's just going to come back marketer. <laughs> um, 
and then I'll find out I'm related to all these crazy people. But I think the uh, one of the other things is the weight of the wire. Like if you live in Baltimore and you go anywhere in the world still today and you tell people you're from Baltimore, the first thing they say is the wire. And so I think talking, I know you have like the unwire idea, but I think looking at how do you, how do we embrace it? We can't just say like, yeah, that's not Baltimore. It is. And, and it is it people's impression. So how do we embrace it, build off it, change it, change the conversation around it, bring in positive images that people have seen in the media, et cetera. A new TV series uh, about uh, entrepreneurship. It's, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. thing. I we'll never. Call East. We'll, call, we'll call it yeah, I, never, I like that. <laughs> I never saw The Wire. Not a single episode. Yeah, I haven't seen that. And much of every time I, in New York, people say the only time, oh, yeah, I love the wire. And I came up with this idea about unwiring Baltimore, right? How do we unwire <laughs> Baltimore? Hashtag unwire Baltimore. But I think that the thing that we could do to that question is look, the, a lot about that was about the grit of the city, right? And about, you know, you can, you can make it through every, anything and everything. And I think that's really true about this city, right? I mean, the city has a lot of grit and a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, I grew up in Queens. People say Baltimore is like Brooklyn. I'm like, no, it's not. It's like Queens, right? I mean, it's real people. It's no, it's not hipsters. It's like the old Brooklyn. But um, <laughs> so I just think that there's something about that, about the grit of Baltimore that you that we need to play on. I think we have. I think we really have to just highlight the wins. I mean, when yep. we have wins like like the Portenises, like the Millennial Medias, like the Under Armors, we, we just don't highlight them enough. We take them for granted, and we have an inferiority complex. And, and unwiring is a, a great hashtag. We need some great marketers. Great. On that note, uh, we're going to turn it back to Chan, and thank you to all the panelists thank so much. Thank you.